This is the Nebraska Broadcasters Association History Project. It's a look at the people and the personalities who have made Nebraska Radio and Television what it is today. Today we are recording at WOWT Channel 6 in Omaha for the NBA. I'm Neil Nelkin. When you work for a long time in television news, especially in one city, you get to observe the people, the politicians, the society as it actually evolves over a period of time. You get to know everybody that makes the city happen. The important people around town, the power brokers, the educators, the people that make the town unique. Best observer of this phenomenon can be a long-term journalist who knew the big power brokers back when they weren't so big or didn't broker quite as much power. You watched them evolve over the years and became close to them and understood what makes them tick. A long and varied career in television news makes that happen. We want to hear all about it, so today we welcome to the NBA History Project, Channel 6's Mike McKnight. Mike, good to have you here. Thank you, Neil. It's been a long time uh, in this business, meeting people like you, back when we both had hair here instead of here. Yes, <laughs> we were young and pretty back then. Started in 1975, part-time, actually. Where? Right here, Channel 6, but I was in Lincoln. I went to the University of Nebraska, Lincoln, and they needed a stringer there. Nobody covered Lincoln from Omaha back then. It was sort of an outlying area, you know, anything west of the Platte River. Uh, everything was kind of focused here and not there, so I was a stringer in college, and they gave me a little wind-up film camera, and I would go out and shoot stories down that direction, Lincoln and West, and I'd put them on the Greyhound bus. There was no microwave back no, then. No, there was no microwave back then in the 75, 76 era. No and sound it, either. Uh, no, at that time. Uh, occasionally they'd come, they'd send me down a little sound camera, but usually it was just a wind-up camera. I still remember covering some big stories like a grain elevator fire, and uh, there was an explosion in Lincoln. I think it was in 1975, and I was close by. I got right there. I got some great action, but the camera wouldn't zoom. It had to zoom. It was just a little turret type of thing. And so there were some people trapped up, I don't know how many, 100 feet. And I was getting video of that. <laughs> All I could see is a little speck up there because there were no zoom lenses back then. And it was film, so I'd shoot, shoot it, and then I'd unload it in a dark room type of thing, sometimes in a, in a, under a blanket. And then I would put it in a little canister and put it on the Greyhound bus, and it came up here and ended up on the air. Processed it and put it on the air, <laughs> and at least you had the coverage. At, back then, yes. So you were in Lincoln for quite some time. I was in Lincoln, uh, obviously graduated University of Nebraska. Degree in? In, in journalism. Okay. Um, back from arts and sciences, they didn't have a journalism college per se back then. And I was lucky enough to start as a stringer at Channel 6. I uh, also worked at KLIN in Lincoln part-time, and that's so I got my feet wet in the news business. I was able to cover some big stories back then as just a rookie. Um, you know, the, the wounded knee trials were going on at the federal courthouse then, and there were... Uh, a lot of other big stories. There was a couple of big murders down there that were huge stories, and I was able to do that as just a, a rookie. And so and then came 1977. I graduated in December of 76, and, uh, and Steve Murphy, a great news director then, offered me a job. I came up here and still remember sitting in the conference room, and, you know, and he was kind of like, Mike, uh, how soon can you start? <laughs> still in the very building we're in. In this today. very building, yes. Uh, Steve Murphy, like you say, a legendary uh, broadcaster, legendary journalist, made a lot of history here in Omaha. Uh, you found a photo of I him. Did. Now, this obviously goes back quite a few years. Yes, yeah, Steve. I don't know if we uh, can see that. Uh, if we want to come in on that. We maybe? actually named the conference room here in his honor. And so that's where I got that picture. It sits in the conference room. And this was back when Steve... Uh, covered both, uh, well, we had still cameras back then. Uh -huh. Even though we were TV, you'd have a still camera and you'd take the picture and you'd hold it up just like this. So in other words, Steve would be sitting here at the desk and say, well, this is the fire I covered today. So that was Steve Murphy. He was just a legendary, he was a great man, a great journalist, a very by the book, but very fair. He understood the meaning of the word integrity as it oh, relates to news. It, very much so. And he hired and trained some terrific Oh, journalists. he did. There were a lot of people who came through here, part of it because of him. Mm -hmm. And people stayed, too. I mean, it wasn't as transient as a business as it is now. Back then, people would come here and they'd stay for pretty much their whole careers, or at least for five to ten years. And maybe 
somebody would leave maybe once a year or twice a year. But now, you know, of course, it's changed so much. It, it's, it's kind of a, a, a business now where people come and go a lot more. When you came on to Channel 6, was it still WOW? It was WOW. And then we just, we were bought by the Chronicle. I just said started, bought by the Chronicle, San Francisco Chronicle, and they added the T to it, if I'm, my memory serves me. And so they at separated that time, the radio from right, television. Right, the happened. radio used to be here, you know, right. uh, it's, it's actually in a sports room now. WOW radio. And FM. Right. They separated when Chronicle bought us and they added the T. And then also on the, when I first started, we were a different affiliate, we were CBS. Right. And then it changed to NBC. And I can still remember the controversy, it's kind of interesting, where at the time there was a debate among NBC affiliates whether to run Saturday Night Live because it was just starting and there were the rumors about, oh, this is the, the humor was going to be a little bit off color. And there were actually some stations, that, I, if I recall right, in, in the country who didn't run Saturday Night Live to begin with, uh, NBC affiliates, because they were worried about the content. Mm -hmm. And so, of course, we ran it. And, you know, it's history now. This is success of Saturday Night Live. So as a CB, CBS affiliate, uh, W-O-W-T, television, Channel 6 in Omaha. Then it changed to NBC right after that. Right. And uh, it's been that way ever since. It has, you know. Mm -hmm. We saw you uh, early on when you were reporting from Lincoln doing a lot of the outstate coverage. That's right. That was in 1980. I worked uh, in Omaha for three years. Uh, really had a great time here. And then they decided to open the State Bureau, they called it. Uh, back then, they figured out a microwave system where you could actually microwave live back from Lincoln. So it was in, I think, God, was it the first national? I can't remember the name of the bank. It was That's pretty US bank. back then. It was a big bank that was right next, near the Capitol. They were able to put a microwave dish on the top. Now, to begin with, it was difficult to get the signal back to the microwave. So we would go on top of the bank building and do our live shots. So I'd be standing there, and it'd be a windy day. You know, 40 mile an hour winds, you're standing up there blowing around trying to get the microphone to hold still and not have that wind noise. We're staying on this roof 14 stories up. But it was a great view. We had a, a great shot of the Capitol. It was just a fun time, and so much was going on back then. In the 80s were just a fun time, an interesting time, especially in the news business. We had mm -hmm. so much going on in that decade that uh, is in the history of Nebraska and Nebraska broadcasting. And not only Nebraska history, but one particular incident uh, contributed to national history in terms of uh, legal events that oh, took yes. place. Oh, uh, yes. You covered the Irwin Charles Simons. Irwin Simons, yes. The six members of the Henry Kelly family killed in Sutherland. Right. And uh, you covered that story and then later on followed him in Lincoln. Yeah, what made it interesting about that is that, of course, the history of that had to do with, and you would probably know about this since you were North Platte, about quashing coverage. And that really became a First Amendment type of argument there. And and pre that became pre-trial gag order. Pre-trial gag order, where a judge tried to stop us from reporting certain things. So that it became sort of a line in the sand that was very important for coverage all over the country. Mm -hmm. You don't want a precedent like that. And then it, I just followed it through, and then he went... He was found uh, not guilty by reason of insanity, and he went to the Nebraska Regional Center, in which I worked my source and worked my way in there and actually sat down many times with him and convinced him to do an interview. And finally, he, he agreed to do an interview. What was interesting about that was that he said he'd do an interview on TV, on camera, if he didn't show his face. Well, you know, we had all kinds of video of him walking to the court, you know, I said, so it didn't make sense that... He didn't want me to show his face, but I could show all this video of him. So I did the, I just said, I don't care. I just want the interview with you. So I did the interview with him. He talked about a little bit of what happened, but mostly wanted to talk about how he could, wouldn't be a danger in the public. Because what was interesting, here's a man, not guilty by reason of insanity, killed six members of a family. And uh, what, maybe five, eight years later, he was out going to movies on furlough. So that became yeah. very controversial. And... <clears throat> that story, as well as another one at the regional center where a mother had killed her kids, also released after about two years, that led to, those stories actually led to a change in the law, um, especially the, the earlier one. That was uh, Stella Almarez, I think her name was. Yeah. And I interviewed her just before she was released to, I think, went to Colorado. And this was like three years after killing her kids. 
but not guilty by reason of insanity. So what they decided to do then, at that time, what I had discovered and, and reported and broke the story on was the regional center would let them go, le release them if they determined they were no longer a danger and let them go. It was just doctors and they would just disappear. And people, where are they? They're no longer. And hope they came back. Right. And so what happened is after those stories, the legislature changed the law in which now a judge, you have to go before a judge and a judge decides if you could be released if you're sane enough. And so, of course, that kind of put the finger in the dike on those folks mm -hmm. getting out of the regional center. So that was kind of a significant change in the law because of the stories that we did out of Lincoln. That Simon's interview you did, uh, anything revealing there? Did you get the feeling sitting there with him that he was dangerous? Did you get no. the feeling that he was lucid? Yeah, yeah, I thought so. And I think if you remember covering the assignments, it was sort of like it was uh, a temporary insanity. Like when he, when he killed the family. But mm -hmm. later when I interviewed him, he was like talking to your uncle or something like that. He was very calm and he was, he was sort of soft spoken and mm -hmm. you didn't think it'd be a danger. You know, and so uh, that was kind of interesting in talking to him, you know. And, and it's not only that, but also I interviewed people on death row, the same kind of thing. You know, I interviewed Robert Williams before he was executed. Well, you sit down with him, and you go, well, th this guy's like talking, like I said, to your uncle or something like that. But he'd killed two women, and he was going to be executed. And it's just, that's kind of the way that y you meet these people. In fact, there was one time, I, th I think I calculated that I'd interviewed people either on death row or in prison that murdered more than 40 people. And you sit down like this and talk to them. And sure, they seem ordinary, but you have to remember at one time they were a vicious killer for whatever reason. And I can still remember one time, I don't want to belabor this a lot, but one time I, had to, I was uh, going to interview uh, the head of the, the Hells Angels who had murdered a woman up here in Omaha. And I wanted to talk to him about being a jailhouse lawyer. He filed a lot of lawsuits. So I went in, they, at that time you could interview inmates. And so they took me, I went in the prison, we went to a classroom. I still remember he was there and he was a huge man. And I was sitting here and the guard went out and shut the door. I'm sitting there like you this. Alone. <laughs> I know. And, and he, he, the inmate uh, just for about two minutes just kind of screamed at me, not screamed at me, but would argue with, and it wasn't me, it was about the media how the media was this and this, and then just like that, he goes, now let's talk about lawsuits. So just, you, you know, you learn how impulsive they were, mm -hmm. and you realize that they were impulsive and somewhere they crossed the line and became a, a killer, and you go, you gotta remember, these people might seem ordinary like you and me, but somewhere along the line, they crossed the line and killed one or more people. Snapped. Yes. Did you ever cover an execution? Yes, I did. In Lincoln? I was a witness to an execution. I was a witness to the uh, execution of Walking Willie Ote, and uh, that was a unique experience that people remember back then because we hadn't had an execution since Starkweather. Mm -hmm. And what I was oblivious to was that I was inside doing that in all the circus atmosphere outside, if you remember that. Oh I my God, there. it was crazy. It was crazy back then. And, State but Patrol I, set up areas that were fenced, separating the proponents and opponents. And it was wild, very loud, it was very wild. vociferous demonstrations. But I and inside, nobody knew. I didn't see any of that because we were, we, we were instructed, and actually, uh, we went through a, a run through it, basically, because he was supposed to be executed about a year before that, and we had to go to the, the prison, get set up for it, and they got a stay of execution the last minute. So actually, it, when it actually happened was the second time. And I still remember being in there. Uh, you couldn't have a camera in there like this. All you could have was a pen and paper and a microphone. And I had my tape recorder because they give the last statement. Part of your job as a witness was you, you went up to where they kept him. And this was literally less than an hour before the execution. And all the witnesses, we stood around him and like me to you and uh, any last words. I still remember he looked each one of us in the eye, didn't say a word, just looked each one of us in the wall. And, you know, and it was sort of, I, I had this feeling like he was, he was saying through his eyes, see in hell, sucker, or something like that. You know, that's just the way he, it, it, that's the appearance. I still remember those eyes. And then, of course, then we went down to the execution chamber. And back then, it was an electric chair. And so all you do, you have a pen and paper, and we just wrote down the notes of what happened. And so then afterwards, uh, the media interviews us, which is a little uncomfortable. But I felt people go, why do you want to witness an execution? But I felt at the time is that if we think 
uh, the death penalty is cruel and unusual punishment, then we have to know what happened there. We have to know that it was carried out as humanely as possible, that there wasn't any kind of a mess up. And if you don't have witnesses there, especially the media witnesses, to give an objective view of things, you know, we have to know what's going on. So before the public can decide in Nebraska if it is cruel and unusual, you have to know what happened first. So that's kind of the way it was that uh, I, I just described what I saw. I didn't put any opinions in it as far as I could tell. I just, uh, uh, just described what I saw. What effect did that have on you either personally or professionally when you're reporting? You know, it didn't really have an effect. I, I thought it might, but it, it didn't really. I think I was so focused on getting everything right. This is what I saw, writing it down, describing what happened. I didn't have time to think about the emotional aspect of it. Of course, after that, uh, uh, several times, well, not several times, but a couple of times, I was called in to be a witness in first-degree murder cases later in which they were found guilty and sentenced to death. And the, their, the appeals would be, is it cruel and unusual punishment? Like uh, the Norfolk bank robbers, I was called to testify up there to just describe again what had happened during the uh, execution of Ote to, so they could decide if it was cruel and unusual punishment. So that was the after effect. But emotionally, uh, I've been pretty good. I did have a lot of people contact me and say, you know, uh, especially those in the uh, psychological field mm -hmm. that would say, well, come in free of charge if you need to, somebody to talk to. But luckily, it hasn't affected me. Occasionally, if there's movies like The Green Mile or something, I don't watch those, you know. I don't need that. But uh, So you don't revisit it? No, I don't revisit it unless there's another, you know, we had the Carrie Dean Moore execution, and so I did do a little bit of uh, this kind of uh, background on what an execution was like, though it was completely different for uh, when they had the electric chair compared to what it is now. We're going to jump around a little bit okay. time-wise, but uh, one of the things I know that you're fairly proud of is having a story that you did <laughs> broadcast on the CBS Evening News with uh, Walter Cronkite, the most trusted man in America. Think anybody out there remembers Walter Cronkite? Well, you and I, I do. I hope so, we do. That was really an interesting experience. It's when, it was probably within the first six months of when I went to Lincoln and opened the State Bureau. And I'd heard something back then, that was the Iranian hostage crisis. They were still hostages. So it was a very intense time. And there was a, a, a large Iranian community in Lincoln. And there was an Iranian student that had died at the regional center, okay? Uh, it was probably, uh, it, it was nothing suspicious. It was a medical thing. But of course, at that time, there's a lot of tension. Well, in, in that society, they have the funeral the next day and they carry the casket down the main street. Well, what they did was they carried the casket down the main street of Lincoln, Nebraska, right from 44th and O Street down to 33rd. Uh, 44th was where the mortuary was, and I still remember that. And so there was like a group of, and remember the time, the tension. And so there, there's a whole group of, of Iranians carrying a casket down O Street in Lincoln, Nebraska. Well, I had the exclusive. I heard about it, and I got there, and I got all this video. Film or video? It was uh, video back then. It was a big camera. It was video. And uh, I remember, so I got a call from CBS News. They, uh, our staff here told them about that. And Walter Cronkite called me up, uh, his producer to begin with, and then later him. And they helped me word it the way they wanted it. And I put together the story. And then I still have that tape somewhere where, you know, where Walter Cronkite saying, and let's go to Mike McKnight in Lincoln, Nebraska. So that was kind of a special moment. That's a big deal. <laughs> I thought so back sure. then. I don't know how, like you said, I hope people remember Walter Cronkite because he was one of the great journalists we ever had. The floods that we've seen here oh, in the man. past year or two here in Nebraska, <laughs> uh, a lot of people don't oh, remember the fact that there have been floods that's, here that's for why I'm, years and years, and you covered the uh, early floods. That's why I'm chuckling a little bit, because I remember covering the ice jam floods of 1977 out by Valley and Fremont, and I remember mm. back then somebody saying, oh, this is a 100-year flood. Well, then I covered a flood in 19... Ninety-three and two thousand eleven, and this last year. Every so hundred years. There's a hundred years, so somebody doesn't do the math right on figuring hundred-year floods. But yeah, uh, that's when it started. Uh, uh, the ice jam floods out in Fremont. A lot of the old timers probably remember that. And then uh, ever since then, right up to last year, uh, I was right out there last year, out by uh, uh, Valley Waterloo area. And I remember too, there was one. I just got out there right after they started 
evacuating people from Riverside Lakes, Waterloo area. And I was up on this uh, um, viaduct up there, and I got some great stuff, I thought, of people being rescued on a, in an old military truck, and they're going across the floodwaters and all that. So I'm getting some great stuff out there, and then pretty soon I see the water all kind of getting around me. And I'm on this viaduct, but it's, they're cutting off Dodge Street. And so finally somebody, a state trooper, I think, came by, and, and he said, look, you're the last man. If you don't get off of this, you're going to be stuck on this viaduct. So I drove out in probably about six inches of water, and probably within a half hour, it was closed. And you're in a Channel 6 vehicle. I was in a Channel 6 vehicle. And Channel 6 is saying, don't, uh, yeah, don't risk the don't, vehicle. Don't risk the vehicle. Yeah, you can swim out, but right. we'll get you a helicopter. But that vehicle, don't leave it there. So uh, that was kind of a, a different moment. And, of course, we're planning uh, here at Channel 6, we're going to be planning a, a year-long uh, anniversary type of story, too, on, on how it was, because that was so memorable. I mean, mm -hmm. I can't remember in 44 years in this business um, a flood event that covered so much of the state. I mean... I've been to flooding in North Platte, been to flooding in Norfolk, been flooding Niobrara, and of course around here, but never where it covered all of that. So the more things change, the more they oh, change. I know. Right? There you go. There you go. Also weather-related tornadoes. Oh, You've man. seen all the good ones. Yes, going back to, I, I actually started at Channel 6 right after the 75 tornado. And so every time there was a dark cloud, we'd go out and do a live shot. I just mm -hmm. always thought it was kind of funny. We're standing on a hill telling people to go to the basement while we're out trying to watch a tornado. And as I was telling you earlier, back then it was exciting. You know, you go around with your camera. Oh, I got a, I got a twister on camera, you know. I got a little funnel cloud coming down. And now you go out and everybody's out. Gotten, they have it on their cell phone, which unfortunately is too bad. They shouldn't do that. But, but they you, all do. They come up and they go, here, I've got a good shot of it. And so all you got to do is get permission to use the video. You don't even have to shoot it yourself. You can get a tornado from five different angles. Or send up a drone. Or send up a drone, too, on, on the coverage, yeah. So, and so 75, I was there right after. I just happened to be lucky to, to kind of see the Grand Island tornado coming. And so I got there about 45 minutes after it hit Grand Island. In fact, I drove through it in Aurora. I mean, it was a little bit, I think, north of us. So, but I could tell there was something going on. You could change that pressure. But then I got to... to to Grand Island, and so I was there right after that happened. And I mean, driving around down power lines. Uh, my first stop was going to the hospital. I it was, I guess, at that time, smart enough to think that's where the action was. Somewhat there as they were bringing in victim after victim, and it was quite a chaotic time, especially when you cover a tornado at night. Right. You know, and, and there's many times I'd go out chasing tornadoes, and we got great weather guys here on locating that. They say, Mike, uh, you're right under it looking up I go I don't see it because most of the tornadoes we get here in the middle of the night are dark you know and so th those are kind of exciting you get that adrenaline going you've also covered uh, some pretty good scandals and oh, some man some situations that people didn't want covered mm -hmm. and I'm thinking mainly of the uh, Commonwealth savings fiasco uh, there were a lot of people involved in that some of them pretty recognizable names they were and uh, you covered Commonwealth it was a very interesting time back then, covering the Commonwealth failure and the aftermath. I mean, the, the first day, I don't think we knew what was really going on when they were changing the locks at mm -hmm. Commonwealth. You know, uh, For those who don't remember, it was a savings and loan and uh, failed. It was a state savings and loan. And what people didn't realize back then, it, it, that the insurance, it wasn't FDIC. No. It was a state fund. And what people didn't realize is that there was millions of dollars saved, but there was very little to cover if it went down. And, so and it went a, down. And there was a panic. Yeah. And so they, they basically shut it down. And at that time, there was many people that invested, uh, partly because they were offering, 10, if you can believe this, 10% on a CD, 10% return on a CD. So it, it quickly became a house of cards. And what followed that is a lot of people had put so much money in, you know, Back then, people, they would put everything in one basket. Mm -hmm. And at 10%, there nice was basket. a lot of, uh, yeah, basket. So that went down and everything that followed because getting paid back, I don't even remember what most people got, just pennies on the dollar. Virtually but there was a lot it. of, you know, and it, it, then it came out about the Attorney General of Nebraska had made some profit off that. He was impeached at the time. There's a trial. Um, and, you know, at the time, I had a good relationship with him, and then it was just kind of all this. That was Paul and Douglas. Paul Douglas, yeah. And I still remember, I can't remember what the uh, hearing was over. It was after he'd been uh, impeached, and somehow a criminal indictment. I can't remember how that worked back then, but I still remember being at the courthouse in Lincoln, and he came out of the hearing, and we chased him down 
the stairway. And that was just kind of kind of different. Here's a man who was probably one of the most respected politicians and well-known. And powerful. Powerful in Nebraska, and you're chasing him down the stairway trying to get a comment. It was just, it was just an odd time back then, an odd time. Also, the uh, Franklin Credit Union fiasco scandal. That, that was every bit as nasty. That was up here in Omaha, Franklin Credit Union, in which uh, the, the person who, who ran it supposedly had connections, and there was some sex scandal going on there. And I can still remember, I think it was uh, James Martin Davis. He might have even been on Larry King at that time, the Larry King show, the real mm -hmm. one, because Larry King was the name of the Franklin uh, director. But anyway, I still remember him saying, Omaha is a town that would rumor itself to death. Because it was, that was a story that was so difficult because we were chasing rumors. There were less facts. It was more rumor. And uh, there, you know, there was a lot of weird things going on there. There was an investigator hired by the state who ended up dying in a plane crash with him and his son. They'd gone to Wrigley Field to the All-Star Game, flying back, dying in a plane crash. Well, a lot of questions about that of, plane crash. Oh, my goodness. It, it, it never stopped. And then there were these, what they called the, the Franklin tapes. And there were these, uh, I think it was two or three people, uh, a, a young woman, a young man, there might have been a third, uh, who were involved in this that were taped by this investigator. So they all had tapes where they were making these allegations of these powerful people in the Omaha area who were involved in this sex scandal. And so I was able to get the tapes. And I still remember one time, who I won't say who gave them to me, obviously, but I still remember meeting someone at a rest stop, and they're, they're saying, and they didn't even say anything to me. They just left their window down and, and just kind <clears> of <throat> like that. And I walked up to the window, and they were sitting there, so I just took them. That's how, that's how the deep throat type of thing happened back then. But it was, it was just a, 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 a crazy time because there were so many rumors and less facts in that story than they could ever get. How do you separate the rumors from the fact oh, in a story man. like that? It's, it's very difficult. You try and, and verify everything you can. But back then, too, there was so much co competition to try and get that because it was such a sensational story. You know, you wanted to be first on this angle or this angle, and you had to really be careful. And I'll tell you, there was sometimes you just walk the line. Do we run this or not? And then you, have, you go to people like Steve Murphy and John Clark, a news director after an assistant news director, and you go, well, what do we do with this? You decide, well, you got an extra source with this, that type of thing. So there was less in that story of actual written fact and more of sources, some unnamed sources, obviously, because they were worried. And that time, it's not just worried about your name out there, but people were really fearful for their lives. I mean, that, that was the, the whole atmosphere we had. It was just a crazy time. Certainly fearful for their jobs. Yeah. Yes, that's true, too. And some people did lose jobs. Yeah. Let's get on to something a little less serious. <laughs> Uh, Bob Carey and Deborah Wingert. Remember those days? Yes, I do. I was down in Lincoln. I was right in the middle of all that. That was kind of interesting. Obviously, he'd met Deborah when they were filming Terms of Endearment. So I covered Terms of Endearment. That was a big thing in Lincoln. They came, the whole crew. And uh, so he kind of had a relate, developed a relationship with Deborah Winger, who at that time was a very famous actress. Mm -hmm. I don't think she's been much lately, but back then. And if you're talking about the one incident, well, I had a good source at the police department. They said, well, you, you wouldn't believe who got a ticket tonight for speeding. And so I was able to nail that down to what happened. And she had taken the limo, the state limo they had, the governor's limo, and, and had driven out to East Lincoln for something. It got stopped speeding. Uh, Deborah, here's this actress, a Hollywood actress, driving the state limo and got stopped for speeding. So that was kind of interesting. But it was, it was still, it was sort of like a Camelot time now. I yes. mean, Bob Carey was that kind of, he had that kind of charisma. I can still remember there was a big issue back then on closing one-room schools. That was a huge controversy. I still remember going out to a small town in central Nebraska where he was the speaker. And obviously, everybody, they were worried about closing their school. And I thought, man, there could be people with pitchforks and, and, and uh, pickets and all that kind of thing. And he gave this speech. People listened. And afterwards, everyone wanted to get pictures with him. Mm -hmm. Even though he was going to close their school and there was right. a lot of uh, a lot of angst about that. They still want to be near him. So it was kind of, rarely do we have somebody like that that draws that kind of uh, attention. And he was one of those kind of guys that you just, you'd be around him, you know, and he just, you just go, well, this is as close to a star as we're probably going to get. Well, he was our governor, but he was known as Rock and Bob. <laughs> yeah, that's it. That was, those were good times back then, I'll tell you. When you're a young reporter and be able to cover him, uh, those were good times. And he'd go to airports and Willie Nelson would <laughs> oh, greet yeah, him. I know. <laughs> 
Uh, he had a lot of friends in show business. You would never know who would show up at the governor's mansion. That's true. <laughs> and he was a Democrat in a Republican state and out in the third district, which was as Republican as the yeah. world ever saw. Well, that's where you were. He yeah. was a rock star in yeah. the third district. Uh, people didn't agree with his policies necessarily, no. but gosh, they loved I him. I think he, was, he would be a great example of how charisma and just that aura will overcome politics. Mm -hmm. Very few people have that, you know, where just that sense you're around somebody that's special, you know, and has that special connection, despite, even if you don't agree with his politics, especially a Democrat in Nebraska getting elected. Oh, I remember the excitement when he was in Lincoln announced for the presidency. Oh, no, I know. Uh, that was a crazy scene. Yeah. It was a lot of fun. Obviously, that didn't transfer to the national level, but no. locally, he was, he was a great guy. But he was running against Bill Clinton at the time, oh. and they, things got a little nasty there, although <laughs> they, they were friends. Yeah. Uh, another governor that you kind of carried, another Democrat governor, would have been Jim Exon. Big that was Jim before the, Exon. Yeah, he was a governor. I also, as a senator, he was just a great guy. And mm -hmm. actually, uh, when we moved into our house in Lincoln, uh, our neighbor behind us was Kay Orr, who became mm -hmm. a governor, and then Jim was one block over. But uh, he was just a great guy to talk to, you know, and, and uh, he was a Democrat, but... You not know, really. Not really. But he was, he just had that kind of, a different kind of charisma where you just felt like you were with like a Steve Murphy, somebody that was bigger than life. When he was in the Senate, he reminded me a lot, uh, not physically, but the way he operated, a lot like Lyndon Johnson in the Senate. Yeah. He was really good at persuasion and getting people to see things and do things his way. I, I still remember he did, uh, this is one story I don't tell a lot of people, but he offered me the job to be his PR guy. Um, in, in Washington. So I went out there, flew out there, I was out there for something else. So went, sat and talked to him. He showed me around the Senate and everything. And then uh, two things that I almost took the job, but two things, number one was, I don't know if I could handle the lifestyle out there, you know, the I, I had a pretty good gig in Lincoln then where I could do what I want. And, and you were married. And, uh, no, oh. not at that time. Okay. So it might have been good for a single guy to go out to Washington, but I just thought, I do I want to get tired? The, the second thing was, he wrote, I still remember down, well, this is how much I'll pay you. And I go, you know, that's the last one I make in, in Omaha, Nebraska. You know, why would I go to Washington and spend more to live? And I said, uh, uh, you know, I respect you a lot, Mr. X, but I can't afford to come out here for that. And uh, we've had a lot of Republican governors since those days. But they're all Nebraskans, and there's a big difference in this part of the country between partisan politics and being a Nebraskan. Yeah. And these guys were all Nebraskans when you look back at them. Oh, yeah. And uh, the, the, they really did put the interest of the state, but they were all good with media. Oh, yeah, they all We've never really had we that contention. No, we never did. I don't remember ever having anybody, you know, yell at me that was, a, you know, say, because you're always, here's what I feel about some, especially now the stories, the kind of stories I do. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I, I kid, but it's kind of true, and that is that if I made both sides mad, then I've done my job. Sure. Because <laughs> you're never going to satisfy one side or the other. They're all going to say, oh, that was twisted, that was unfair, so. You've done a lot of investigative type of coverage here at yes. Channel 6. Yes. Uh, lately, uh, in the last, oh, probably 20 years, I've kind of developed Six on Your Side, which is, it's what I really have involved into, which I really enjoy, and that is helping people. Helping people who have been scammed, helping people who have had something, maybe the government uh, did something that kind of, you know, uh, their street or, or their house or their electric bill, that type of thing. You know, help people solve those. Maybe get their money back. Maybe get them some sort of satisfaction. Maybe a little bit of justice, you know. I've even, some of the stories I've been able to do maybe have led to prosecutions where they never would have. For example, like contractors, you know, I mean, most contracts in Nebraska are pretty good, but there's some who would take money, not finish the job when they get a pattern of that. Well, most of the time they were never prosecuted because the judges would say it's a civil matter. You know, oh, they started the job and they never finished. Well, they, you know, you, you give them $10,000, they do $500 worth of work and walk away. Well, that get to be a pretty good little scheme going, you know. If you get a pattern that when you get some of these guys to do it 10 times in a row and uh so basically i, I can convince some prosecutors doing stories over you know why aren't you doing anything why are you doing anything that they they're now starting to prosecute some of those folks for a pattern of it and it's not just it's bad business that went south some of it is they're doing this intentionally and they got to know some of these people got to know this is how the law works if i do this they're not going to prosecute me 
Well, now they are doing it. So it, it's, it's kind of changed the outlook on at least that part of, uh, of an industry. As far as the investigative reporting, do you ever develop a Mike Wallace type of reputation when somebody sees you, they say, oh my gosh, it's I McKnight. I don't think so. I think part of it, what helps is, that a lot of people probably don't know, is that I do, I'm a one-man band. For about 30 years now, I shoot myself. I got this, you know, my camera, it's me. People say, well, when's your crew gonna be here? Well, me, myself, and I, my four-person crew, me, myself, and I, and my camera will be there a certain time. So I think it helps when you're behind the camera they feel more comfortable. And uh, plus, I don't dress up a lot. You know, I try and be like the everyday guy. And, and you I'll don't just, attack. Right. And, and sometimes, you know, I can sit there and I can, I can interview you and I can hold my camera down like this. Mm -hmm. and you don't feel as, you're looking in my eyes rather than like this. I'm not work, working to the camera. Right, exactly. And you feel more comfortable. So that I think that helps a lot. So I, I've had some people say a few things like you're going to get yours someday, but, uh, yeah. uh, but nothing that's been... Uh, bad as far as I'm concerned. I think I try to be as even as possible. You're never going to please everybody, but I try to be as fair as possible. And I hope that's the reputation I have. Some people might not agree, especially what's tough to get a hold, a hold on right now is, is Twitter, mm -hmm. Facebook. Oh my gosh. Everybody's that's something when we journalist. started this business, we didn't have a business. Well, they everybody. think they are. Yeah. And that, that causes that blurry line. Uh, what is really fact and what is uh, not? What's the definition of news? You know, the, I, I think there was a, what was the show, Broadcast News, where they said, well, you crossed the line, and the guy says, well, how do I know what the line is? They keep moving the sucker, right. you know? <laughs> You've been around long enough where you started out with a film camera, oh. big, bulky video cameras that came along, heavy recorder packs. Right. And now this. Well, luckily, it's come to this because two back surgeries later, after I see some of those, uh, some of the, the uh, sports, when you see some of the uh, broadcasts on TV, NFL games, you see those big cameras, those mm -hmm. car guys carrying around still. I'm going, boy, buddy, I know a good back surgeon. You're going to need one eventually. So luckily it's gotten a lot smaller. But, yeah, back in those days you had all these cables and everything hooked to you. And it, was, it was an interesting world. I still remember when I first started, the old timers that time, great photographers were using film, and a CP-16 is what they called it. And they basically thought, ah, videotape will never last. And so I got a chance to use videotape. We had the first videotape camera in the market here, and I was one of the first people to use it, primarily because I taught myself how to use it, because the other ones didn't really want to get involved. It was bulky, and it had a lot of cables. And it wasn't film. Right, right. and that, of course, that leads to, if you want to, the, the helicopter wars. Let's go there. <laughs> the helicopter wars in Omaha. It, it wasn't long lasting, but uh, one of the other stations got a nice fancy helicopter, so everybody else had to catch up. And so what we did was we leased one here at Channel 6, and it was, like I said, it, it looked like something you unhooked at the fairgrounds, you know, one of those from one of the rides. Fair, from one of the rides. So anyway, it's a little tiny thing, and I was uh, probably one of the smallest guys. I knew how to do the videotape, so I would always get sent. I can still remember one time we had to go chase down. There was a balloon, one of these big balloons going across the country. Somebody doing a cross-country Guinness World Record or whatever. So I got in this thing, and the guy didn't, the pilot was a great pilot, but he didn't have the doors on this thing. And we go chase this balloon, he found his, finds out, well, the balloon is 8,000 feet. So we go up to 8,000 feet to shoot, and there's no doors on this thing. Number one, not only am I up there like this, looking down 8,000 feet, but it was cold. People don't realize you go up there, it gets pretty cold. So we had uh, helicopter, we had to use the helicopter. So we went through that sort of cycle, the helicopter wars, and then I think the powers that be realized that's pretty expensive. Mm -hmm. So that kind of faded away. So the, that was probably in the early 80s, I think. Somebody landed where they shouldn't have? I, 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 yeah, that was kind of part of it. Somebody landed on the Capitol. It wasn't our our station or our helicopter. It was someone else's landed on the Capitol lawn, and uh, I don't think the state patrol and the, and the uh, state officials really appreciated that. So it kind of, that kind of ended the helicopter war. Over the years, you have uh, been recognized for your work. You received a lot of awards, outstanding journalism awards. You actually were nominated for an Emmy at one time. Yeah, that one was interesting because um, 
it, you go against like the Denver stations and that. So I went out, we went out to the Emmy Awards in Denver. You know, I was the three finalists when you're nominated like that. Go out there, I got the tux and all that and sat down. And they showed it. What mine was, was the work of a one-man band. So I put together a nice reel of everything I've done all by myself. And so they showed that, and I thought, well, I might have a pretty good chance of winning this thing. And then the next one was a Denver station, and it was a gal who'd spent three weeks in Romania with a crew of five people shooting orphans in Romania. So I t turned to my wife and said, well, let's go. <laughs> I'm, not win I'm not winning this one. <laughs> the awards, of course, mean a lot. Yeah. The recognition by your peers and recognition of the work you've done over right. the years. Speaking of the work you've done over the years, we talked uh, a little earlier before we went on. All the film, all the tape oh, man. that you've done, it's still here, isn't it? Yeah, it's not very organized, but I think I, I know where to find it. You know, and, and sometimes if people need something, do you have anything from 1980 or this story happened in 81? I've eat, and what you get a lot of, too, is you get a lot of independent producers like in L.A. that will call and say, you know, we're doing a story like on the Beatrice Six or something like that or, or another crime, maybe the Simons thing. We're doing mm -hmm. a 30-year-later type of thing. Uh, do you have any video we can buy? Well, you got to find it. So I, it, it takes some searching to find that stuff because it's basically in the archives. I mean, and a lot of it's, the other thing is, a lot of the machines we used back then, they're not around anymore. So how do you play this? Stuff? Yeah, you, you might have one and hope it works. That's, mm -hmm. that's kind of the way it goes. But it's all here, yeah. downstairs? Yep, it's down here. <laughs> <laughs> now, um, the question, of course, is you've been, what, 43 years? Uh, yeah, going on 44 years now. Why have you never moved on? Why have you never gone You know, that's a else? good question. Uh, early on in my career, I had chances to go to Seattle, Phoenix, Denver many times because they were opening bureaus there right and left, and the, the one news director there offered me like three different bureaus. And I'd go out there to these things, and I'd go, i get this feeling I, uh, I always worried about. I'd say, well, the bigger the pond, the bigger the piranha. So I was worried about that. You know, I had a pretty good thing going in Lincoln, and plus, some of these places you go, they wouldn't pay that much more, but they'd offer you like overtime in comp time, sunshine time. Well, good luck trying to collect that. Right. And I still remember one time they, they, I got offered in Denver a job in the Western Slope Bureau, which was over in Aspen, which had been pretty cool, right? And uh, I remember going out there, checking out the job, and uh, one of these little things you look at, I, I just happened to notice in this news, oh, you had this new four-wheel drive news vehicle, right? Oh, yeah, it's just two years old. And I looked at the odometer. It was like 80,000 miles. So I'm sitting there going, let's see, 40,000 miles a year? That means a lot of travel. <laughs> Especially in the want, mountains. Do I want to work morning, noon, and night? So I, I, had, I, I do that anyway, but at mm -hmm. least in Lincoln, I, had, I knew the lay of the land, and that was kind of in, where I wanted to stay. The job you do puts a lot of stress on you, but you're married with two yes. sons. Yes, yes. Uh, how'd the family make out with the job you've been doing? I've been very lucky. Uh, my wife is very understanding because I don't know how many times that I've left the dinner table. I've left her at restaurants to go out and chase some story. I've left in the middle of the night to go cover something. Somebody's giving me a tip on something. And she just says, be careful. And she's very understanding. There was times early on where, where she held the light for me. We'd go out to a story. And then uh, my boys, uh, they didn't go into the business. But still, they've got a little bit of news in them. They'll occasionally call and say, Dad, there's six cruisers going down Dodge Street. You better find out what it is. So uh, they, they recognize the, the news business. They're not in it, but they still know how it operates and, and how I've still got that drive to, to be there and be there first, you know. Be, be first, but be right. Do you have the urge or desire to influence the next generation of journalists? Do you go to schools? Oh, yeah. Just lecture? Yeah, I do. I give speeches, not only to schools, but also like uh, Kiwanis clubs, mm -hmm. that sort of thing. And I enjoy that now because, especially for older groups like Kiwanis and that, and uh, Optimist clubs, because they're kind of my generation, and I do a lot of scams now, and I can talk to them about scams, because they're really the main target of those things. And, and I really enjoy trying to give tips on avoid being a, a scam victim. And that really helps. And a lot of that I try and preach. It's not necessarily you, but you can save your next door neighbor from being scammed. You know, so I try and pass on that message. So I, I enjoy doing that. To me, it's helping people. It's using my knowledge and my experience and this camera to expose issues that might save somebody else from losing maybe their whole life savings. 
It's been an interesting time recently. I'm thinking mainly the past five or six years of uh, the media being accused of fake news. That's tough. It's yeah. a tough phrase. It's derogatory. And for somebody that's made your living in this business for all these years, what does that type of fake news designation well, mean? Well, first to you? of all, when somebody does that, especially on Facebook, you know, I'll tell you when it comes time to retire, the first thing I'm going to do is get off Facebook. Anyway, uh, because <laughs> dealing with those people, most of them are good, but some people, it's, it's like fake news. Okay, tell me what is fake news? What is it? Are you, say, are you saying that it didn't happen? Well, I give you proof it happened. It's on camera. You know, how, why call it fake news? But it seems like fake news has just become a term if I don't agree with what you've said, so it's, I'm going to call it fake news. You know, I'm, like it didn't happen. But I, many, everything we put on there, we could prove or back it up. And so it did happen. It's not fake. It's just you have to convince people, and maybe they don't agree with you, and, and sometimes you just can't. That's just the way it is. Do people recognize the difference between the national media and the local media? I think to some degree. I, I think to some degree. They live here with you? They yeah, they live here. They, you? Yeah, they, they know me. I've been here enough that, that I'm local. And, but still, people, unfortunately, the national media has influenced people on how they look at us. You know, you like to tell them, well, hey, I'm not like that, that person. You know, I'm not like how uh, that network did it. You know, we don't do it that way but you have to convince people that you're not part of that mm -hmm. to, to a certain degree. And you just hope your reputation and fairness carries over the, from that. Not to be negative, but you look at some <laughs> of the people that are, are coming into the business, appearing on camera in the news business. Uh, you're just not as pretty as some of them are. Oh, no. Uh, I'm, I'm television old. is a visual medium. How do you hang on so long with uh, your great American looks? <laughs> You mean no hair? I didn't mean I that. I did have, because I started when I did have hair. But anyway, um, I think you, you, you just try and be fair. You work hard. You know, you never give up. And you try, and in, in this case, to try and help people. So I think people see that. It doesn't matter what, what you look like. It's what you put on the air. It's how you carry yourself when you're out in public. That's the persona that you want, not whether you're pretty or not. <laughs> well, in a lot of ways, I suppose you are pretty. Yeah. Mike McKnight, our thanks to Mike for joining us with his history on the uh, Nebraska broadcasting industry. He's been here for most of it, especially in television. Our thanks also to Jeff Saban and WOWT here in Omaha. For the Nebraska Broadcasters Association, Executive Director Jim Tim, Chairman Emeritus Marty Schneider, and the NBA History Project, I'm Neil Nelkin.